particularly for our title, those words, Wisdom and Revelation. And our single study this evening will be intended as a refresher in the use of God's Word, the personal use of God's Word. Now, in verse 8 of this chapter, the same uh, uh, thought has been given, speaking of God wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And verse 17, in a way, picks that up. It comes from God, but it should be in us also, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, or for the knowledge of him, as some would choose to translate it. Now prudence in verse 8 refers to mental activity, insight, understanding. It doesn't have so much to do with the future as the word prudence has today, but it simply means insight, uh, mental activity in connection with the truth. And verse 17, therefore, echoes the thought. It is a prayer that we shall have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, it has a small s, spirit, in our translation. And there are some friends who will argue that it's a reference to the Holy Spirit. But most take it, to both translators and interpreters, as a reference to a disposition that we will possess. The word translated spirit is simply breath. It can refer to the breath of life, the spiritual element, some often frequently the Holy Spirit or a disposition. And uh, to make that clearer, a lot of translations will use an A rather than a V, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Either way, Probably, more likely, it is a spirit of wisdom and revelation, a disposition, an ability to understand and to grasp the meaning of the text, the meaning of the word, because it soon becomes clear that that is the sole source of wisdom and revelation for the Christian believer. So the meaning of the text is that Paul prays that the Ephesians and all who read this letter will have from God a spirit, a disposition, an ability, if you like, of wisdom, understanding, and revelation. Not personal revelation in the sense that we shall have anything revealed to us from the Word of God that is not revealed to anyone else. There is only one truth running in the Word of God, but the spirit which enables us to see it and to grasp it. Now, he writes to believers, but they must see the message of the word, the knowledge of the Lord from the word. They've already seen a great deal. They are saved. They've understood the gospel. They understand much of the word, but there's something very precious that they will have an abiding, hopefully, ability to grasp the meaning, the sense of the passage as we prayerfully open the scripture. Now I can illustrate this uh, fairly well by referring to people who have little or no time for this. And sadly it's becoming fashionable, even among quite a few pastors these days, not to be very interested in a meaning in the Word of God. In fact, they're rather frightened of it. And I've written a lot about this in that little book, not like any other book, the Bible being unique. But there's a sort of fear has come in to many good people, 
concerning the way of understanding and the way of interpreting God's word. And the root of this fear is people who are over-imaginative in their interpretation of the word of God. They make all sorts of things mean what they are clearly not supposed to mean. They, some people preach sermons using texts to derive and construct a message which is not really to be seen in that text. And because people don't want to do that, they don't want to make the word of God mean anything they want it to mean, then uh, they recoil in the opposite direction and they say, and this is getting very popular, particularly popular in the seminaries, they say, well, the word of God must be treated like any other human production or book. And it means what the author intended it to mean, and they say the human author, it means what whoever it was, a prophet, whatever, it means what he meant it to mean and what he meant to, uh, to his contemporary hearers to understand him to mean, and nothing else. So we will use technical instruments entirely to unlock the word of God. And, and this is a good thing of itself. We'll put a great deal of attention on the literal meaning of words and the grammatical structure of the passage and things of this kind. And we will recoil in horror against any deeper sense or spiritual message which may be intended and may be coming through but that may need a particular spiritual outlook to see. And so we've got a lot of very dry, technical exegesis going on. And this is what most of the colleges teach these days. It all arises out of a fear of those people who free will too much and are too imaginative and can derive anything they want, more or less, from the text. But it's gone to a wrong extreme. And I've spoken about this fairly often, I think. But just to remind you, there are certain rules that are being laid down today, and I just summarize them. Every passage in the Bible has but one sense. That's said very often. Single sense only. So if it is a passage which is recording an historical event in the Old Testament, that is all it is telling us. We should not be looking for any other message or truth behind the recording of that historical event. It's just a piece of history or whatever. And uh, anything that is said, there'll just be a single sense. And that's true, that's how we speak to each other. We say things and we're speaking in one dimension. We're saying one thing at a time. And we don't want our words to be analysed as though they could possibly yield uh, a kind of sub-message, a subtext. We think of one thing at a time. But of course in the Bible, it's deeper than that. If there is an historical record concerning events in the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all these historic events, it's not just history. God is saying something. He's providing examples. He's providing situations which will have a parallel in the lives of Christians in every age. Whereas we see rewards faith or punishes unbelief and the circumstances in which it all happens. There is a subtext. There is a spiritual message there. There are parallels and so on. But I don't want to go too far into this because I want to be positive tonight. This is a single sense, no allegorization in the Bible. Well, actually, there is some allegorization in the Bible, but what there is is a, there are many, many parallels, parallel situations which can be applied to our lives today. They say when you interpret the Bible, you go to any passage, you must not go, and this is a terrible rule, that's being taught today, and by good people too. They say you must not go to any passage with any presuppositions or expectations, because if you do, you're bound to read them in 
to the passage. And that would be quite wrong. You mustn't do that. However, if they took the time to trouble, the trouble rather than the time to study the Apostle Paul, they would see that he instructs us, and I'm not going into this tonight, he instructs us to do just that, to bring expectations and presuppositions to the text, to know the kind of thing that we're looking for, not to read it in, but to recognize these themes when they occur. And that's what we should be talking about this evening. Oh, they say all sorts of things. And they say you mustn't ever interpret a passage in the Bible using information which was written later than the passage that you're looking at. You mustn't use any subsequent information to interpret a passage. Well, that would be true to do that if the Bible was a human production. Because the person who wrote the earlier passage would know nothing about what the later writer said. But this book actually has one author. And so we compare scripture with scripture, as 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 tells us to do. We compare its teaching, and we let one scripture on the same subject inform on our interpretation of another scripture. And we are to do that. But you see, they've so rationalized and humanized, in a sense, the study of the Bible, that all that's gone. Well, by this kind of straight-jacketed manner of interpretation today, mostly people don't say, see the great evangelistic arguments, they don't see many of the lessons on faith, they don't see the glories of Christ in many passages of the Bible, or lessons to the church, or a great deal of exhortation or encouragement. But we're going to be talking about personal Bible reading. We need to be able to read the Bible so that we have eyes to see the spiritual message intended by God in, and sometimes a little behind, every text. And the first rule for doing this is in our seven, well, verse 16, that precedes our text, where Paul says that, that I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ will give you this a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Well, friends, prayer, that is the first thing. Pray to God for light and understanding. Pray to God to see the meaning of the Bible. Not a meaning which is unique to you, but something which, when you see it, is plainly and obviously the uh, intention of the passage. But let's look at some of the expectations and presuppositions that we have in this letter to the Ephesians. And I must speed on quite quickly. As we look at verse 17, well, you study Paul's letter to the Ephesians, you can take every verse. Every verse is rich and has a lesson. You can study each verse in isolation from every other verse. But tonight, we're carrying out a different exercise. We're seeing how this 17th verse is actually illustrated by everything that follows. I give you an example where you find that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the wisdom of revelation in the knowledge of him. There's immediately an example. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. That's a subject. The hope of his calling. The anticipation of your heavenly call. That you'll know more about heaven and your calling and all that God will do to take you there. That as you read scriptures which refer to the afterlife and to heaven and to the future that God has for you, your soul will be thrilled at the mention of your spiritual home and you'll be mightily encouraged and you'll see the riches of your coming inheritance and the future glory of Christ 
You see how 1 verse 17 flows into verse 18. Oh, that we can have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, so that the eyes of our understanding are enlightened to know the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, that refers to us. And then to God, what is the exceeding greatness of his power? That's another subject. And you can look at the letter to the Ephesians quite legitimately and profitably in this way to see almost all of it as an outworking of that 17th verse. Oh yes, I want the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that I understand the spiritual message of the scripture. So what am I looking for? It's as though, this is one way of looking at this epistle, it's as though Paul then says, here are the subjects. I will line them all up in this, my letter to the Ephesians, one after the other. Now, there are a recognizable 10 distinct topics that you find in Ephesians with subordinate topics also. But you can see at least 10 major topics. And these are examples of what we're looking for. Now, I often say that when you read the scripture personally, privately, you're saying to yourself, is there a doctrine here that I am to learn? Is there a view of Christ here, Old Testament or new? You ask that question, the passage I'm looking at. Is there a view of Christ? You ask a number of questions. You say, is there a duty here for God's people? Perhaps I'm neglecting something. Perhaps there's a command here for me. Is there a reproof here? So see, you come to the text with expectations. This is what the Bible's all about. You don't just read the history and say, well, I've learned some history. I've been to a history lesson. You say, is there a view of Christ? Is there a doctrine? Is there a reproof? Is there a duty? Is there something about the church? Is there an encouragement? Is there a promise? And then you have eyes to see. And you say, well, of course there is. It's so obvious. And your soul is lifted up and you're instructed and you benefit. But what I'm just going to show you in the brief time we have is an even longer list than that that we commonly use. To have an even longer list on a piece of paper in the back of your Bible is going to open one's eyes even wider to what there is to discover and to find and to study. And then things become plain and clear. So we've looked at verse 18, future hope. That's on my list. Is there something about my future inheritance, my future home in this passage? Then I go down to verse 19 and here is a second subject. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? Is the passage that I am reading something which records or speaks of or promises the mighty power of God in answer to my prayers or to sanctify my heart or to discipline me or to attend my Sunday school teaching or my preaching or whatever? Is there something here about how God constantly works in power toward his people? And moral power in particular, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places? What about my moral resurrection? My improvement in character day by day and month by month and year by year. Is there anything in the passage which assures me of that invincible power of Christ, the power which was wrought in Christ when he was raised from the dead? Verse 21, far above all principality, when he was raised from the dead, he was demonstrated to be much more powerful than every authority on earth and in heaven beside himself. 
And in verse 21, power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come in this world. All the CEOs in the world don't have the power of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ who's working in our hearts. All the generals in the world, all the dictators or prime ministers, whatever, in the world, but also in that which is to come. All the great instruments of grace, revival preachers, people who had mighty blessing, all gathered together, well, their power is dependent upon Christ. And if there are passages of scripture that exalt the power of Christ, what a great subject that is. Verse 22, and to put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And the church will come up again and again in this passage. Is there something about the church? in the Bible passage that I'm reading, Old Testament or New. God organizes his people into an institution called the church. And in any given age, that institution is divided or represented in gathered churches. And God is dealing with his people through gathered churches. That's, by the way, why we have a high view of the church. You'll find the church mentioned repeatedly through these chapters. It's a great shame that so many people, and many of them good people, form their own organizations. So-and-so's evangelistic society, so-and-so's apologetic society, so-and-so's ministry. And they name ministries after themselves, and they create organizations and so on to conduct their ministries. And they mean well, but really we shouldn't be doing that sort of thing because in the Bible it's repeatedly said, the church, the church, the church. And what is the church? Well, it is gathered churches, individual local churches, constituted according to the rule of Christ and governed by him. And every ministry that's carried out, really according to the scripture, should be under the auspices of an individual church. And the people who work in that ministry should be under the discipline of their local church. How much, this is not my subject tonight, but how much disorder there is today, even from well-meaning people. And we should really be trying to reform that and wind that back because it's the church that God has promised to bless, not Dr. So-and-so's organization, however well-intended and however sound, we should be working through his institution. And there are those famous old words that the Lord Jesus Christ founded only one institution, and that was the church, nothing else. Well, friends, I want to move on to the believer's separation. And you find it in chapter 2. And you hath he quickened. Separation is a great theme in the Bible. We have recently been conducting studies in the Pentateuch and going through Genesis and Exodus. And how much you see that cable running through those books that there was great commotion and the withdrawing of the blessing of God when the family of God became merged with the world and then God would deliver them and take them out again. And you can look at the Pentateuch with almost that one theme in mind, the recur recurring collapse of the church of God, the typical church of ancient times into the world and God bringing it out again. The same theme runs through the New Testament. And we see it here in Ephesians chapter 2. And it's something you put on your list. Separation from the world. Concern about the world and worldliness. And you hath he quickened, brought to life. 
who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. That's all one word in the Greek. According to the prince of the power of the air. It's Satan's world. It's a system. We have to be so careful with its culture. So careful to identify elements within the culture of the world which are relatively untainted, which we can use, and to avoid those which are distinctively worldly. That can't be our subject tonight, but just to refer to the principle of separation. And we particularly notice this wherever it comes up in the Bible. It's ruled by the prince of the power of the air. It's his world. It's a system. It's a campaign to take people away from God, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's where we were. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation. Again, that's often translated culture, uh, conduct. Could be translated culture. You could say roughly the Greek word means something like this, among whom also we all had our toing and froing. In times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, what we wanted, what we wanted to see, how we wanted to be seen, considering ourselves, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But we've been withdrawn from that system and saved from it. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together. And what has he done? Verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What a remarkable sentiment. We've been taken out of the world and lifted above it. But we're still here on earth. Ah, yes, but our interests are up there. And it's as though in our hearts we're already there. The things that excite us are the things of heaven. Our minds are there, even though we're still posted down here to represent the Lord hath raised us up together in our minds and in our hearts and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're in another place, even though we're here. It's a remarkable thought that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. But this is all about being withdrawn from the world. Verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. And that's almost another subject. What is there in the passage about sanctification, about conduct, about character, the good works that have been foreordained for me? Verse 11, the subject continues, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens. Here is the thought too of separation from one world into another. At that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And here was a great passage which gives us yet another subject. And that is that we're in the house now. And we have peace and security. And we're one with the ancient people of God, the children of Israel. Or at least the elect among them. And we're on the same level with them. For he is our peace, verse 14, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You know in the Old Testament, when Isaiah had his great prophecies that God would bring in the Gentiles 
and Jeremiah the same, they understood that the Gentiles were going one day to be saved. Abraham understood it. All the world would be blessed. Repeatedly in the Old Testament it was said, the Gentiles will come in and be saved. But they never thought for a moment, I'm sure, that the Gentiles would be equal with the children of Israel, indistinguishable from them, in the same church of Jesus Christ. They never thought that. Perhaps Gentiles can be cleaned up and become God's children, the godly may have thought, and be in the worship in the outer court, in the court of the Gentiles. But they never dreamt there would be absolutely no difference. The middle wall would be broken down and all would be one, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain of two one new man, so making peace, and both reconciled. Verse 16, you see how it runs? Subject after subject is the knowledge of God flowing from chapter 1, verse 17, and we identify these different subjects in all parts of the scripture. The possession of peace. Oh, we have peace. Chapter 2, verse 17. Came and preached peace. Reconciliation joined together to you which were afar off in the world and to them that were nigh, the children of Israel who had privileges but now all one, for through him we both have access. But peace comes in more and more. Verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, the elect Israelites, and of the household of God. I'm in the household of God, built upon a solid foundation. Verse 20, the foundation of the scriptures given by the apostles and prophets, all based on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and his saving work. And the church comes in yet again. Verse 21, do we honor the church? Do we have a high view of our church? Are we loyal to the church? Do we seek our ministry from within our church and serve him through that church? Do we support it and aid it? In every possible way, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, temple for praise and worship, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation, a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. So all the subjects we've looked at, they're getting a little jostling together in these verses. But these are some of the subjects we will be looking for throughout the scripture. Here's another one, chapter 3. Time is going on swiftly. The subject of representing the Lord, the responsibility and the duty of making him known. And this is brought up in chapter 3. If I write a list on a piece of paper in the back of my Bible, with all the subjects I want to look for in all the scriptures, here's one of them, making him known. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The Apostle Paul had had a great revelation that the Gentiles were to come in and that they were to be equal with the converted children of Israel. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, but it was partly made known, as I've been saying. The godly could see from the prophets and even from the Pentateuch that the Gentiles would be brought in, but they didn't realize on what a wonderful basis. 
which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, New Testament prophets, that is, by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, the church. I was explaining some two or three years ago to some uh, uh, believers who worshipped as uh, uh, in a separate, exclusively uh, Jewish assembly, that they shouldn't be in that, that they should be with Gentiles together, Jews and Gentiles, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now to the great point I want to raise, whereof I was made a minister, says Paul, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me he can't help inserting this, who am less than the least of all saints. Is this grace given? He never forgets he was a persecutor and a rebel. That I, of all people, should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That was his special ministry, to make Christ known throughout all the world. Everyone who is not an Israelite is a Gentile. This is the preaching of the gospel in every nation of the world. Verse 9 of chapter 3, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. They're complex words, but they tell us this, that Almighty God takes very, very seriously indeed that Jews and Gentiles are absolutely one in Christ Jesus. This that some people teach, again, this is a digression, but that some people teach, no, no, the Jews are always extra special. And God really has them as his number one in mind all along. And the Gentiles are only second-class citizens. And one day, it'll be all the Jews again who get all the blessings. And that will be the ultimate blessing for the world. But that's completely wrong. Because Paul says repeatedly that God puts enormous importance on the absolute equality of saved Jews and saved Gentiles. That's very important. Verse 10, to the intent. Do you mind my going through like this, just speeding through the book? I was hoping, I don't know whether this is succeeding, in showing you that you can go through Ephesians and you can see all the major subjects which are our presuppositions and expectations for the study of the whole Bible. I am not going to get far. But until it's time, we proceed. Verse 10, to the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the good angels and archangels might be known, made known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. What a verse that is. I can't help this continuous digression this evening, but you see all the angels and the archangels looking over the parapets of heaven, looking down on earth, amazed, dare I say, with their hands over their mouths, in wonder. This is how God works. This is what Christ has done for his people that all the world are going to hear the gospel and Gentiles as well as Israelites are going to be saved and God will so change the hearts of billions of selfish, self-seeking people that they'll be concerned not for themselves but for the eternal salvation of other people and go round preaching the gospel. What a demonstration of grace the angels will say, what an exposition of the manifold wisdom and kindness of God. Verse 10, to the intent that now, even now, unto the principalities and powers good angels in heavenly places might be known, made known by us as we evangelize 
we show them how God has worked and put grace in our hearts. The manifold, the many faceted wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, there's subject after subject here. And we could think of the love of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 13. Wherefore I dis Surely this is one of the most glorious passages you could ever read. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family of heaven, in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Oh, we are looking in the scriptures for the love of Christ for his people. We see it in the New Testament, but we see it in the Old also. And we see it in psalm after psalm. We see it everywhere. If only we're looking for it. There's a special prayer for this, that Christ may be in your hearts. Thomas Watson used to illustrate this verse by saying, here is an example of something being in your heart. If you're a worldling and you're greedy, money is in your heart. If you're a Christian and you've learned to love the Lord, Christ is in your heart. And you see him in the scripture. That's your equivalent. Money isn't in your heart. Christ is in your heart. He's your vision. He's your inspiration. He's the one you love to think of most and speak with most and see most in all the books of the Bible. So Paul proceeds to deal with this, the love of Christ in our heart. And then he proceeds to the place of the church in chapter 4. There's so much about the church. And here's how we ought to be working, all of us, through the church. Look at verse 15. I cannot resist this, dear friends, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love we all work together. We love Christ as individuals and we serve him and learn together through the church that he has founded. Dear friends, is there a view of God in the passage? Is there a doctrine? Is there a duty? Is there a reproof? Is there an encouragement? Is there a promise? Is there a view of the church? Well, add to all that, and here's a little overlap. Some of the things that you can identify here in the letter to the Ephesians following the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Is there my future hope in the passage that I'm looking at? Is there the power of life which he gives me? Is there believer's separation? from the world? Is there sanctification? Is there material about peace and security? My peace and security in Christ. Is this about making him known? Is there counsel and exhortation and advice? Is it about his love? 
Is it about the church? I could go on. Chapter 6, the warfare. I won't read anything. But is it about the warfare? My personal warfare against sin and the devil and doubts and temptations. The warfare of the defense of the faith. The warfare of the battle for souls. These are the kind of topics that we look for and we bring to light the sacred page and we see what's there all the more clearly because we're expecting to find things along these lines. So I do hope that'll have been of some help to you in gaining a greater sense facility, faculty, ability of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him.